Before we get into the episode, I just want to let you know that you can pre-order my new book, Reach All Readers. And if you pre-order by February 12th, you'll receive free access to my Science of Reading mini course and get immediate access to a huge bundle of editable reading games. Learn more at reachallreaders.com. Hello, Anna Geiger here from The Measured Mom, and today I was able to talk with Melanie Brether. She is a special education teacher who became interested in the science of reading when she learned that her son had dyslexia. So that sent her down a path of learning what would it take to help him learn to read, and she hasn't looked back. And I absolutely love the advocacy work she does for the science of reading and all the ways that she educates teachers through her Instagram account, through her Twitter account. She's made it her mission to help not only the teachers at her school, but teachers everywhere learn more about the science of reading. So I know you're going to enjoy our conversation. Welcome, Melanie. Hi, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for joining me. And we always love on this podcast to talk to people who have found their way out of balanced literacy and now understand and apply the science of reading. And you're definitely one of those people. Can you tell us a little bit about your background as a teacher and then what led you into the science of reading? Well, I'm going to start right away. It's, it's really because of my son, Benjamin, that led me down this, I would say, rabbit hole, science of reading, obsession, um, because I was taught um, balanced literacy really through osmosis. Even my curriculum is based on very a balanced literacy approach. Um, and I've been in pretty much special education. I would say the majority of my career I've taught many different um, behavioral classes, uh, also students with learning disabilities, but I always taught them based on what I was taught in my university program. And then when my son was um, starting kindergarten, that's when I started to realize, hopefully as a teacher, obviously, that he was having difficulty. And I went into just finding out, like, you know, why is he having so much difficulty remembering his letter uh, names and sounds? That was really a red flag for me. And here, where I live in Montreal, Quebec, we teach, uh, we learn two languages, English and French. So I actually thought, well, it's because he's learning a second language, it's difficult, he's in French immersion, um, where, you know, Anglophones, we speak English at home. But I really just brushed it off as he's having difficulty maybe because of second language. And then it just continued to get more difficult. We went to see a speech and language pathologist to find out a little bit about his difficulties. They couldn't diagnose, though, dyslexia. Uh, until uh, he was the age of like nine and a half. So we went through all those difficulties. Uh, He was getting support, however, because everybody here was taught the same way I was. Um, We were really reinforcing those balanced literacy strategies of guessing the three cueing. I was reinforcing that at home, memorizing words. So he really Mm -hmm. didn't get effective intervention, I would say, until I started learning about Um, what effective. I I had no clue. I really thought balanced literacy guided reading was the best thing for him, and I was doing that at home. So he really is my reason why I went down this journey. So what was it that led you away from balanced literacy? Was it a particular book or a podcast or an article? Like, how did you see there's another way? Well, when he was diagnosed with dyslexia, I felt I knew enough about dyslexia as a special education teacher, but it turns out I didn't, just like Mm -hmm. how to teach reading. And I remember watching a Dyslexia 101 webinar. I was like obsessed watching TED Talks and just, I was like, I need to learn as much as I can about dyslexia. And that's when I first heard about Orton Gilliam, Wilson, Barton, and evidence-based interventions. Uh, and the science of reading. And it was like this aha moment of, wow, I never heard of any of this. And I'm a teacher that I love professional development. I love learning. I'm open to trying new things. It's just mind boggling to me that I had never heard of any of this uh, in my circle. And it seems to be there's a lot of teachers all over the world that was not taught um, any of these um, you know, effective uh, strategies or these, how we learn to read. So that was really the aha moment. And that's when I also started learning about the science of reading. Um, and uh, I, I just, I joined the Facebook group uh, with Donna okay. um, a few years ago. And that's kind of when it led me down the rabbit hole. So um, I took courses, PD, uh, everything and anything that I could get my hands on to not only help my son, but then obviously transform my teaching. So were you your son's tutor or did you get special help for him? 
So this was during the pandemic, uh, which was oh, a yes. little challenging. And around here again, uh, I looked up Orton Gilliam uh, because I wanted him to get effective intervention during that time. So he was also just diagnosed and we were home. So I actually took the Orton Gilliam associate level training and he was my, I asked them if he could be my student. Now they don't usually do that, but they made an exception for me because it was during the pandemic and getting a, another student to work with in person was impossible. And so he was, I was doing Orton Gilliam lessons with him. And um, so I did my practicum with my son, Benjamin. Mm -hmm. And then um, we actually decided uh, to get him into, find a school for him. And he finally only though, unfortunately in grade five, was able mm -hmm. to get the intervention and uh, just teachers who are knowledgeable about how to help students with dyslexia. It's like a, a special school. so. Um, he unfortunately did not get the intervention early on, and that's why I'm very uh, passionate about spreading awareness to parents about, you know, don't wait for a diagnosis, don't wait and see. Uh, mm -hmm. I even said that I taught grade one at one point, and I would say, don't, you know, just don't worry, just know. wait a little bit. There's going to be this light bulb that goes off. Um, I said all those things that now I tell, you know, teachers, um, you know, uh, there's always, you know, when you know better, you do better. That's my motto I live by. But um, I, I did all those things. And I, I, it's not because I, I just didn't know. Mm -hmm. So how is he doing now? You know what? I would say, uh, you know, we know that it's a continuum. And, you know, from mild, moderate to severe, he's definitely in the severe category. Uh, okay. He really struggles still. Uh, he has improved so much, don't get me wrong, but as... You know, a 13 year old, he's definitely not at level. And, uh, you know, he's gone for, you know, speech and other tutoring, and he has me as well. Um, but I don't always recommend that to be your child's teacher. <laughs> it's definitely very different from working with students at school to your child at home. But during that time, during the pandemic, it was definitely something. But um, he has made huge gains. But uh, another piece to all this is the mental health piece that I see at home. Yeah. And that's another. Um, something that I, w I want to even talk about more on my uh, social media because I, I don't think people realize the mental toll uh, it takes and I've seen that firsthand with my son so he's doing well he's really the school that he's at is fantastic I actually cried at the IEP meeting but in mm. happy tears <laughs> mm -hmm. for the first time That's because great. it was just finally you're speaking the same language I'm talking um, I was just so happy and uh, his confidence is building. But, um, and I often think that if he did get his, the intervention early on, would he be as severe? Uh, I, he would definitely be in the severe category, I believe, but mm -hmm. uh, would he be maybe mild or, or mm -hmm. you know, moderate, I would say. So that's always in the back of my mind that I have this guilt. Um, you know, he's my baby and uh, you don't want to see of your course. child struggle. And especially as a teacher, seeing your child struggle and not wanting to go to school um it really yeah. breaks your heart so i have a two yeah, this, i wear two hats you know so this reminds me of speaking with lindsay kemeny you've probably heard her talk before about yes. her story with her son with dyslexia too and she talked about the same thing about the the mental health issue and i think he was only in second grade when it was very severe so that's just more to your point about getting help early it's not going to hurt to look into something and it can help hopefully prevent some of this from later on. But I'm so glad he's in a place where he's getting support now. When you look at the teaching that you've done as a special educator, talk to me about how that's morphed, like how you, teach, how you used to support students and how you do now, now that you understand. Well, I think before it was, and we're not really big on programs here for some reason. I, mm -hmm. I don't understand that. I feel like now that I know what evidence-based programs are, I'm the first to be like, why am I reinventing the wheel? It's, um, everything is there before I would beg, borrow, and steal to make a lesson. And, uh, but it was really based on um, guided reading, but with mm -hmm. the three cueing, the memorization, um, mm -hmm. I would, I remember covering up the word and just showing the first letter and mm -hmm. saying to the student, Ditto. look at the picture. And I cannot believe I didn't question how this was a reading strategy. It's like, mind-boggling um 
just, I cannot believe that. So I, I did all that. I did everything that you're not supposed to do. Um, and after learning about the, the research and the body of research um, called the science of reading and just looking at, you know, what are the things that you should be letting go and what are, what should you be doing? And it took me, it's still, I'm still learning. I always tell everybody I'm constantly learning. I'm not at um, I don't consider myself an expert because I, you know, the research is always changing. There might be something I do in my classroom this year and it might change next year. But I do, I'm, it's definitely a structured literacy approach. And I've used a few different programs just trying things out that are evidence-based. And uh, mm -hmm. it's explicit. There's no, I used to not even teach the rules. It would be just like, this is the k sound. This is the letter C. Uh, English is a crazy language. Like the, I didn't know the rules. Like I think I was 42 when I first learned the cat kite rule. Like it was just, <laughs> uh, um, and my students know these rules now. They like, you know the floss rule. You know, they, it's just there's no taking. You know, just you learn through osmosis. It's explicitly teaching them. And I work with students who are struggling, and um, I'm really hoping. Uh, with my school and my school board uh, that the tier one is going to change because I realized yeah. as an interventionist, I consider myself inter interventionist, we call it a resource teacher, and I cannot see the majority of my stu the students in the classroom. And, and it's been like that for the past few years. And we said, like, there's a problem, you know, and we need to make some changes. And there is change happening, which I'm really happy at my school. We're doing a book study with Lindsay Kimini's Seven oh, good. Moves. Good. Uh, just a, a lot of little things like that. So I'm really happy um, change is coming. So you're saying that there's a lot more kids that need to see you than you can possibly meet. Yes. Yes. We, yeah. I, I started using even universal screeners. I was doing the mm -hmm. running records and we were using PM yeah. benchmarks, which is very much like... Uh, um, Thomas Pinnell. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt like I was a guru for that. I had it mm -hmm. all planned out. But uh, I, we switched to Universal Screeners last year, Acadians, and it's been a game changer. That's one thing that I highly recommend. Um, yeah. And then using, you know, diagnostics. And it was a lot of reds, a lot of yeah. red students yeah. at well below benchmark. And it was a little, you know, concerning. But um, I think over time, um, teachers are realizing too, the classroom teachers, the core, you know, tier one teachers are realizing that things have to change as well. And so I think uh, it's just, you know, it's not saying you're doing something wrong. It's just that, like me, we just, I wasn't taught this. And I know that my colleagues and many teachers around the world, it's the same thing. The university programs were not teaching us effectively, unfortunately. Yeah, and I, when I look back to it for myself, I think it's a confusion, a lot of it, about comprehension and where that begins. Like, for me, a lot of the things I was doing, like, you know, guess the covered word and um, use the picture to help and um, use three cueing, like the context, it was all because I thought that I was, by doing that, I was focusing on meaning, which is, of course, the goal of reading, but or comprehension is the goal of reading. But to understand that we have to develop these foundational skills first um, was something I was... I was just, I don't know, I think it was drilled into my head that you never practice skills in isolation, um, that skills work was drilling, and that was wrong. Um, so yeah, there's a, are there, were there any, would you say like light bulb moments as you started learning about this where you, things suddenly made sense? Well, I think the, the memorization of words, because I remember with my son, I would be constantly drilling these, you know, the, the, and even sight words, which I learned that that's not the right definition either. Mm -hmm. It's a word that you automatically recognize, but I would be drilling him with these cards that I, you know, used with my students and he had it in class. And I would, I would get frustrated because I'm like, you just saw this word. And one, yes. so I didn't know as much about dyslexia. Um, I think that's a mm -hmm. huge piece. And now I know obviously, but I, I'd be like this, you know, when they say, uh, how many repetitions does a student need? It's not just memorizing the word, it's you know that process of orthographic mapping. So having him, uh, I like the heart word method, um, mm -hmm. and that's something that I, I changed as well with my students and my son, and I just felt 
okay, it's, he's actually getting it now. He's able to write it, but read it. But what was like our word? I always said it was like our nemesis word. It was still, it would say what, or so it was just like, that was I kind of the aha moment of the, you know, sounding out even those irregular words that can be very challenging for our, our students that are struggling. And for me, that was um, a method that I noticed even with him that he was having more success. So just like working with him, I always call him like my little guinea pig. He would be, <laughs> you know, <laughs> doing all those things. But um, uh, there were so many aha moments. Like I, I've, I've really transformed, I think, everything pretty much. And I, but I'm still learning. Um, you know, I'm not a classroom teacher. I'm, you know, I work with students who are struggling, but there's so mm -hmm. many. And, um, but as I said, change is happening. So, yeah. Well, I remember when I was first teaching first grade, so it wasn't my first year of teaching, but my first year in the primary grades. And I really didn't know much about teaching reading, but I thought, um, well, I can figure this out. Um, before that I taught a group of three grades at once. So now it was just this first year of first grade was just one grade. So I thought I, I can figure out how to teach reading. And I didn't do very well that year to be honest, but I remember I had one little girl who had spent two years in kindergarten, didn't know all her letters, and I spent three months teaching her to read the word the. Like, it took her that long to remember that word. But I remember what I was doing. I was just writing on a paper, having her try to remember it. It was, it was total memorization. There was nothing about, this is TH, and this word TH says th. This is E, and this word E says uh, or not says, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't understand the importance of breaking words down and explaining the parts, and which is I know what you're talking about too, so that kids can actually connect the sounds to the letters in their brain. And map those words. Um, what about reading material? Like, were you using leveled books with your intervention students, and I how was. has that changed? I was, and and you know, you look at it. I think it's the purple challenge. That video really mm -hmm. resonates with me. It was like a, again an aha moment. Um, I had all those leveled books. I had them nicely laid out. I even had like which students, which level would they be at, and. That is something that I've obviously changed. I'm not saying leveled readers are, are like, you know, I, I've seen that. I'm throwing out my leveled readers. They're still books. It's just for our emergent readers and our students who are struggling. They're going to not have uh, learned that concept yet, especially in kindergarten and grade one. And so we're kind of encouraging them, especially if we are encouraging them to guess, you know, like based on the picture. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't use leveled readers. I really use uh, decodables. My principal has been great. I was able to purchase some decodables. And there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, I use UFLY as well. So I use a lot of those, mm -hmm. um, those passages for my, my students who are, you know, based on the scope and sequence. Do you have any ideas for teachers who are trying to help other teachers that they teach with? Because I think you're maybe in a sort of a similar setting since your school is still a balanced literacy school to help them, you know, things that you can share or ways that can get them interested in the science of reading. For you, it was, you know, it was your son, but many people don't have that situation and they feel that what they're doing is working. Um, I just feel like if you tell teachers, this is what you have to do, there's like a resistance. And mm -hmm. uh, so I came in and they know my, my story with my son and all that. And I actually s had the data to say, like we mm -hmm. did our universal mm -hmm. screener. I spoke to my principal. I said, can I share this? with the whole staff and say, we have mm -hmm. a problem here. There's, we need to do something differently. And that's when I kind of did a little spiel about, um, you know, using evidence-based intervention programs. Um, and so it was, we have a problem, now what are we going to do? You know, like most of our students cannot read proficiently. And uh, so I've done some of things like I'm, I'm doing a book study, as I said. I, not everybody's doing it, but it was open, and I have a lot of interested people. I've done, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you did that incredible um, thing with the Science of Reading podcast, like your the 500 <laughs> podcasts that you listen and you organize by topic. And so I did um, popcorn and podcasts where I just picked some of the, you know, I think go to ones that I think, you know, depending on my staff would, and I left in the staff room and they just took a bag of popcorn with the QR code. So it's just like little things like that, that I, I, I personally feel you can't push it down anybody's throat. I, mm -hmm. I think it's just, there's a bit more resistance. And I have a few teachers at my school that see the results. They have that data now to say, look, 
you know, we, we they're look, you know, they're still struggling, but they, they've made gains. We're closing the gaps. So data talks, but of course you need the right data collection tool. Is your whole school using Acadians now or how is that working? Uh, so I am, you know, the resource teacher. I'm the main one and I have, um, you know, uh, my partners. So last year I said, pretty much, we're going to use universal screeners, Acadians. Okay. I want to try this out. So we screened the whole school uh, last year. We did it three times with, and I, I trained my partners at the time. Okay. And this year too, we're doing the same thing. So I do the universal screening uh, with my two partners. We'll be doing that again in, in January for the second time. And then we share the data with the, the school, the staff, the teachers. And um, I find it's just a game changer because I used to use like, you know, as I said, the PM benchmarks. And uh, I mean, it just takes forever to it's, <laughs> it's yes, really not it does, uh, it does. convenient <laughs> in terms of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what that's what we do at, at uh, our school. And it was just uh, I have a very supportive principal and VP that uh, mm -hmm. I just say, can I do this? And they're like, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I don't great. know if every school is like that, but. Um, yeah. So if I, if I think back to myself as a balanced social teacher, if someone had come in and said, we're going to do this assessment and they were going to share it with you, I don't think I would have had any clue what it was even about or that it was valuable. Like, did you have to get some buy-in from teachers to realize why this data mattered? Well, that's it. So when I, I did the uh, initial um, assessment, I always send like a little email saying, we're going to be trying something new this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why, but I, I feel like sometimes teachers don't even have time to, uh, to read a full email, but that's when I met yeah. with the whole staff and shared okay. the data for each. Uh, we shared the data for the whole school. Um, I didn't even share the data like with everybody per class. I, I said, this is the issue with our school because I didn't want anybody saying, you know, I mean, there were lots of reds everywhere, though, so I don't think uh -huh, it was really uh -huh. battered. But, uh, and then I sat down with each teacher and I gave them, you know, a, a color coded to say, these are the mm -hmm. students that are in red, um, well below, these are the students, you know, in blue, green, and, and yellow. And then that's how I made the intervention groups um, okay. pretty much the, the reds. Yellows, too, were, were mm -hmm. trying to, but I, I, it's still, this is very new process for our school and even for me. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I just find it, I, I explain that there's, you know, there's um, longitudinal studies to say that if a student in grade one is not reaching the benchmark by the end of yeah. grade one, they only have a 10% chance of catching up. And I shared that. I said, this is, okay. it's such a sad statistic, but we, I mean, I'm sure, you know, many who are listening to that have seen those studies of, you know, if they're not. Um, about early intervention, if you know that they're they're going to be struggling for the rest of their academic careers, um, so uh, that was a huge piece that I shared with the staff. That I said, you know, they have the data. It's almost like a crystal ball to say, you know, these are the students that if we don't help them, they're going to struggle for the rest of their lives, unfortunately. So I, th I think that's the huge thing about universal screeners that's so different from before, where it's just okay, they're struggling, but I, I know that they have that longitudinal data. Yeah, that's great. I have not heard of someone sharing that with their staff. And I think that's so great because like you said, so many of us just think, well, they'll just catch up. And that's, that is a thing you hear. Like everybody catches up by third grade, which is ridiculous, but, and it still goes around in Facebook groups. Um, and so to give them that, that information from the research to show them how important it is that you take care of this now. But of course, as an intervention teacher, you can't do it all. Are the teachers, I know, like you said, it's a balanced literacy school. Are they able to make some changes in their instruction to help as well? They have, and I even had some of them, you know, get on board with UFLY, which is great. I just mm -hmm. find UFLY, and I, there's many programs that I've tried out. Um, I think, you know, a structured literacy approach is fantastic too, but it's a lot of professional development, you know, in the sense that uh, you know, you need to be able to, like an Orton Gilliam lesson, make your own lesson. It's, it's a lot of, um, you know, PD on your part. And I find time is really difficult for teachers sometimes. So UFLY was one where I felt 
could be something that uh, teachers could try out and see. I said this is not your whole curriculum. This is not your whole program. It's mm -hmm. just one small piece, especially for you know our younger grades. And I have a few teachers, and I, I just always share things with them, like you know instead of memorizing words. I know we we love the cards, so there there has been some change. They, um, I'm very fortunate that uh, they know that I'm really passionate, obsessed about this, but. Again, I don't force it down anybody's you know, throat, as I said. I just find it doesn't work. But there, there have been changes. I've had one teacher adopt another program, and she's had such success with that. Mm. What's she using? Uh, she's using really great reading. Um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's, she's a, you know, a classroom teacher, and she actually has like the weakest students. And um, she, she's, it's just phenomenal that the gains that these kids are making with you know evidence-based uh, a program and um, so it's just like little things like that I, you know I said you know instead of you know like de using decodables don't use the level readers uh, especially for emergent reader like emergent students mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, I, I share a lot of I, I do try and send emails and things like that with uh, I do a <laughs> newsletter each month too yeah uh, wow. where I share them yeah I share all these little tidbits and things like that. Well, I know that people that are listening are very interested in, in the things that you're sharing so that they want to help other teachers at their school. And I know a great place they can go is Twitter or X, which was a surprise to me. I learned about that from Kate Wynn when I was interviewing her. I was like, well, what, where can I go to keep, you know, get more information? She said, oh, go to Twitter. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, I'd never used Twitter at all. Um, and it is. There's a, there's a great subgroup of people that talk a lot about the science of reading and share things like that statistic that you shared, um, helpful research articles, and really all you have to do is just go on there and find somebody like you or me and follow a lot of the same people they're following. And, and you will start curating. Every time you log in, you will get uh, useful information. And so I think that's surprisingly a good place to start getting the types of things that you're sharing. And then, of course, there's there's um, Instagram and, and other social media things, but you know, you talked about how you took courses and, and read things. What were some things that really were helpful to you? Well, I did, um, and I was very fortunate when I joined the, the Facebook group uh, in the science of reading, what I should have learned in college. Um, and this was, uh, they didn't have as nearly as many um, members mm -hmm. now. So sometimes I find it a little overwhelming uh, with yes. all the information. <laughs> but I, I still think uh, it's one of my go-tos in a sense, like, you know, join that uh, group. They're fantastic. I, they gave me a scholarship to take top 10 tools, oh, yes. which I was so thankful for. I found that was fantastic. Um, I've done a lot of... Um, uh, well, my Orton Gilliam training has been incredible as well. That was a great background, um, you know, in terms of just learning about dyslexia and, you know, structured literacy and all that. Um, I also did, my, my bucket list is letters. Unfortunately, letters is not available in Canada. So oh, I keep not. on bugging. Oh. No, I keep on bugging them. Um, my fellow other Canadian SOAR people want that as well but mm -hmm. uh, that's on my bucket list and I I've done you know really great readings training as well which is mm -hmm. completely free so I, I try and share as much free resources because I have I mean I've been fortunate my school board does give some money each year for professional development that you can pretty much choose which is fantastic um, and I've gone to many um, fantastic conferences like the reading league mm -hmm. uh, I went this past um October, which was fantastic. I was there too. I'm sorry I didn't see oh you there. Gosh. <laughs> I'm going again. I cannot wait. I'm going I, again. I hope to go again too. Yes, definitely. Yeah, so uh, I'll have to make, I, and, and that's the thing you were saying about social media. Uh, I never thought social media would such a positive thing in the sense of connecting. Like, mm -hmm. I would never be sitting here with you. Like, uh, it's just incredible, the community out there. Um, just, I, I just find it's fantastic, and I agree. Um, Catherine Garford, uh, Garforth, uh, um, she was the one that told me about Twitter as well. And I go, really? Mm -hmm. She goes, yeah, you have to join. Like, you're, and, I, I, and I was already on it, but I'm like, really? I, I was shocked. But I, I find that's fantastic. And anybody who, like you, if you tweet, I get so excited. And <laughs> I don't do it very much. I'm working on it. <laughs> but um, yeah, well, it was so nice to talk to you. And, I'll, and I know your, your Instagram, is it sore with dyslexia? Is that what you're on Instagram? Yes. So I, I, I played with the words of the science of reading, sore with dyslexia. Um, 
And uh, it's just, you know, bringing those two together. Like, like I think, oh, maybe somebody just thinks it's only about dyslexia. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's about helping all students in your classroom um, and parents, too. I get a lot of parents who hopefully yeah. follow as well. And, um, yeah. Well, great. I'll be sure to share that in the show notes as well as your, your X account and then anything else that you let me know you want me to share. But thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a truly an honor speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the show notes for today's episode at themeasuredmom.com forward slash episode 157. Talk to you next time. That's all for this episode of Triple R Teaching. For more educational resources, visit Anna at her home base, themeasuredmom.com, and join our teaching community. We look forward to helping you reflect, refine, and recharge on the next episode of Triple R Teaching.